Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me to the microphone. I'll promise to make this short. Uh, my name is Rai um, Moran. I'm the uh, director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And uh, a year ago, uh, over a year ago, Dean called me up and he said, we need to do something. Uh, the TRC is ending. This is actually about two years ago now. The TRC is ending. We're going to be a year out of the closing of the TRC, mid-2016, and we should have an event. And I said, absolutely, we should have an event. And, and at that point, we started working together. And today isn't just any day. Uh, it's a very special day. Because if we go back six years in time, June 16th was actually the very first day of the TRC's Winnipeg National Event. So six years ago on this day, we as a country, we as individuals, we as Winnipeggers, as many of you in this room, were waiting with bated breath to see what this process of truth and reconciliation was going to look like. This was back when WAB was still covering for CBC and I had lots more hair and Dean, well, he had, he had long hair at that point actually, so yeah. <laughs> But uh, it was a big day, and, and I know I was there. Um, we were still setting up statement gathering rooms, actually, until about 3 o'clock in the morning, to tell you the truth, because we didn't really even know what the whole thing was going to look like. So now we're six years out, and we have had the opportunity to hear from about 7,000 survivors right across the country. And this event that we've managed to pull together is not a TRC event. This is not a national event. Um, that time is done, actually. This is actually the hard work time. This is actually the time where we need to roll up our sleeves and figure out how we properly honor those survivors that gave so much to us as a country in telling us what needed to happen. And tomorrow night, we're actually especially privileged to be honoring some of the Blackwater survivors that actually went first, that actually went before anybody else was really even speaking up and these Blackwater survivors were actually the the first survivors in the country to bring their case forward and to have it heard by the courts which actually has brought us together in conversation today and uh, we can't forget where we started from and we can't forget this hard work that has already happened and especially in this we can't forget how much survivors have given us through telling us what it is that they suffered and putting this country on a path of social justice, of human rights, of better and more virtuous and normal action. Not only um, is this day particularly auspicious because six years ago we had the TRC starting event, um, our friend Cindy Blackstock also informed me that uh, we lost somebody who had a direct connection to somebody who had a really big impact on this country, and that was the surviving granddaughter of a fellow by the name of Peter Bryce. Now, if you have heard about Peter Bryce, he was one of those brave people that stood up in about 1905, 1906, 1907, and said that what was happening in this country was, in fact, a national shame. We have known in this country for a really long time that change has to happen. And that call that Peter Bryce gave us a hundred years ago or a hundred plus years ago echoes just as strongly today and this is our opportunity to make change to make valuable and real change and everybody here is a big part of making that change and i want to thank you very much for having come here and and participated in this conference the opening plenary that we have tonight actually involves cindy and and wab and is intended to set us on a path of this conversation that we're going to have over the next few days what we're trying to get figured out here, really, is this hard work that lay in front of us. So do we have a clear understanding of what we even mean when we talk about reconciliation? And that's something that we're asking our opening panelists to stimulate our, our thinking and our thoughts on. So what is reconciliation? How do we implement reconciliation is another big question of this conference. So how do we actually put this into gear? How do we move this forward? How do we get the job done now that so many have asked us to do and that frankly we're expected to do? And lastly, how do we know whether or not we're doing it or not? How do we monitor? How do we, how do we understand whether or not we're actually closing these gaps that are still so viciously apparent in the society through obscene rates of suicide and children in care and a host of other things that continue to just tell us how much work there is to do and how unreconciled the society is. So it's a big conversation that we're having and 
It's a big few days that we're having. And I hope that we don't just do this once because what I know needs to happen is that we actually have to do this every year. And we have to keep the fire lit on reconciliation. We have to keep the planning alive because this isn't going to happen just by fluke. It's not going to happen just by us hoping it's going to happen. It's going to take a lot of hard work and it's going to take a lot of planning and a lot of coordination. It's going to take a lot more blood, sweat and tears before we actually get this done to the way that it needs to get done. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank my uh, esteemed uh, conference co-chair and all of the elders and all of the survivors in the room and all of the people that have worked so hard to make this event a possibility. And with that, I'm going to turn the stage over to our first plenary speaker, uh, now an MLA, <coughs> formerly a VP here at the university, and uh, before that, a uh, journalist and a hip-hop artist and a whole bunch of other really exciting things. So without further ado, Wob can you? Hey, miigwech, Rai. I don't have a podium joke. Hamataka <laughs> When to say yan? Um, I'll put you in the gitchi and any mago go a um gitchi aya a ug wa wa isha isha what uh anyway uh machi uh gikino mati gamigong me uja. So I uh tried uh three indigenous languages down there, so I think I got about 59 more to go before I'm done. I did Dakota. Cree and Ojibwe. Maybe Barney can help me out with my new channel after. We'll do it that way. Um, but I always like to start in the uh, indigenous languages that I know a little bit about. Just to make a simple point. Just to prove that the architects of the residential school era failed in their attempt to wipe out indigenous languages and cultures. <laughs> And more importantly than me speaking a language is at night when my two sons go to bed, they pray in Anishinaabe Moen. And so that is cultural survival. And it's a, a marked contrast from the prayers that uh, my father and uncles and uh, aunties said when they were their age. So that's a good one. I also want to acknowledge uh, you know, all the survivors who are here with us today, you know, Barney and uh, Eugene and uh, Bobby Joe and everyone, Doris. I uh, saw many of you on the way in, and so, you know, my uh, heart always uh, swells when I see you, and I see you smile, and you guys are good friends and mentors, and uh, in some cases, belligerents calling me to account. <laughs> so that's good. So I heard some nice uh, songs here, so I want to share a song, too, uh, at the beginning, uh, because I think it does have to do with the point that I made about cultural survival and cultural resurgence. So in Shkeoe and Dinoe Magani took um Shkeoe uh Bejiko Nagaman and Dete Iban O Nagaman. This is uh my late father's song. It actually belonged to his late father as well. My name is Wabanaquit. Wab is short for Wabanaquit. I'm named after my paternal grandfather and his name was Wabanaquit as well. And he um he sang this death song. This is his death song. He passed it on to his father, and that's why I learned it from myself. Yo hey Yah, hey, 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 hey,
Ja, hey, 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 ja, ich, ja, ja, hey, hey, ja, ich, ja, ja, hey, hey, ja, ich, ja, ja, ich, hey, ja, hey, hey, ja, ich, ja, ja, hey, hey, ja, ich, ja, ja, ich, hey, oh, hey, 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 oh, hey, hey, no way. Oh, Mr. Gominik, me watch the new Marganik. The reason why I wanted to share that song is because it has a very uh, impactful story that I think encompasses how it continues to be with us today. So my father, Tabasanaquit, was taken to St. Mary's Residential School when he was a little boy. And, you know, I don't want to trigger anyone here, so it's enough to say that he experienced the horror stories of which uh, many people are, are now increasingly aware. And, uh, you know over and above abuse also included um, the nutritional experiments that Dr. Ian Mosby um, uh, uncovered. But dur during one summer, he was allowed to return home to his mom and dad, uh, Wabanaquit and uh, Nene Gijigok, uh, my uh, paternal uh, grandpa and grandma respectively, and uh, they had a nice time there. And on the last day before Tabsanakwiti Bun and his uh, brothers returned to St. Mary's Residential School. Their father, my namesake, had a nice picnic for them. Got, you know, all the fish and wild rice and uh, stuff we like to eat. And he went to Nestor Falls to the store and he bought little candies and things like that for the boys and put them out. And then they sat there at uh, Onigami and they had a nice picnic together. And over the course of the afternoon, the uh, late Wabanaquit took his drum out and sang songs, including that song, his personal song, which would eventually become his death song. Sang those songs to his sons and said, you know, these, is, these are your songs. You are to learn these and you are to carry them on today. Later, the, or carry them on uh, into the future. Later on that day, the priest arrived from St. Mary's to take them back to the residential school. And as they drove away from Onigaming in the truck, uh, my father began humming, you know, the song. And uh, the priest pulled over, and dragged him out of the vehicle, and beat him, and said, don't sing those heathen songs anymore. Lucky for us, my dad never listened to that priest. Instead, he remembered that song. He remembered many other songs. And then he raised me. My siblings taught us those things. And then we are now ensuring that that legacy lives on to the next generation. That the next generation of Anishinaabe and Suk, of uh, little Ojibwe's, knows who they are, knows their identity. And so that to me is, uh, you know, the first point about reconciliation. that. Indigenous culture is strong. Indigenous people are proud. And we are in a moment of indigenous cultural resurgence across North America. And it did not happen by accident. In fact, the only way that it could happen against the expressed intent by past governments to destroy our languages and cultures was through the determination of residential school survivors elders and traditional knowledge keepers in our communities. And so for that I say miigwech. Hi hi. Kina naskumit kakya. It's an amazing thing. So it was uh, you know kind of surprising for me to hear Rai say that um, it's already been 6 years since the first national event. And I don't think we really appreciate how far this nation has come in six years as a result of the testimony of um, residential school survivors and the leadership of uh, Commissioners uh, Sinclair, uh, Little Child, and Wilson. But it is, uh, it is remarkable. There was a little benchmark, small, that came out last week that showed us uh, that some progress had been made. You know, it's a little discouraging on the face of it. This Enveronic study came out that said 33% of Canadians still don't know what a residential school is. It's discouraging until you recall that Enveronics asked the same question in 2010 and then found that 50% of Canadians didn't then know what a residential school was. So it's still too high, but progress is being made. 
and greater than any sort of quantitative measure of the progress that has been made, what I would point to is the richness of the public discourse on indigenous issues in this country that has evolved over the past six years, right? In 2010, did you ever expect to see a prime minister say that indigenous language and culture is key to preventing youth suicide? Right. Did you expect to see 70,000 predominantly non-indigenous people march in solidarity with residential school survivors in a city like Vancouver? Right. Would you have expected to see Countless examples of uh, fellowship, such as Phil Fontaine, uh, his brother Bert, my late father, and my uncle Fred adopting the archbishop and seeing uh, a bishop of the Catholic Church dancing a traditional honor song, wearing a star blanket. So the country has changed immeasurably for the better, and yet we still have further, further to go. The first national event, as Rai alluded to, I covered it as a reporter. And uh, I recall like the kind of day-to-day sequence. You know, um, I think on the first day there was a lot of confusion about what this was all about. I remember uh, speaking to some residential school survivors and they're very, very skeptical of the TRC. They're wondering what is this thing all about? Why are we supposed to tell our stories? What are we going to get out of this? Why isn't there power of subpoena, why isn't there criminal action, things like that. And uh, where are the teachers? Where are the, uh, you know, perpetrators? Some of the questions that I heard there. But I think that what we witnessed over the subsequent six years was the TRC won the trust of those residential school survivors. And beyond that, provided a forum for healing. At least that's what I witnessed in uh, some of my attendance at those events, you know. And I think it was on the third day that there was a rain. It seemed like a healing rain for many of the people who had uh, started to share their stories and revisit painful uh, past chapters in their lives. So it was nice to have a physical manifestation of the emancipatory mood that was in evidence on that day. But uh, unbeknownst to me, probably the most significant um, occasion of that first national event was, uh, at least with respect to my family, is that my late father made his um, statement to the TRC during that first national event. And it would be years before I actually watched uh, his statement on uh, DVD, on video. And... Uh, I resisted watching it for a long time because I didn't want uh, to revisit what I expected to be very painful stories of his childhood. And, um, you know, we lost him in 2012 and so didn't want to, uh, you know, aggravate the grieving process. But finally, I think maybe in 2014, I uh, decided to check out the video. And so I kind of braced myself. I was like, all right, mentally prepare because it's going to be uh, some pretty heavy stuff. It's going to be a lot of grim stories. But I was totally astounded when I watched the video because it wasn't, it wasn't that at all. It wasn't, you know, uh, the confessions of a broken Anishinaabe. It was a triumphant statement of somebody who had emerged victorious over some of the most heinous acts that a human being can commit to another. When I watched the video, 100% in the Ojibwe language. My father spoke at great length and uh, uh, with astounding eloquence at the Anishinaabe cosmology, explaining, here is what our people believed. Here are the four traditional religions of our people, the Medewin, the Shawanoga, the Wabinowin, and the Ogimayawin. Here are the ceremonies and how to conduct them. Here is how you use the pipe. Here is the sweat. Here is the invocation. And then he explained, here is how you pray in our language. And then he said, yeah, along the way, I had this experience in residential school, and this happened to me, and this is how they tried to take away 
uh, the spirit and the culture and the language. But then he returned at the end, but this is how you pray in Ojibwe. And he described the order of an invocation. Pray to these spirits first and then to these animals, these birds, and so on down the list. And in conclusion, he said, this is a message to my descendants. This is your language. These are your ways. Pick these up, use them, they will serve you well. To me, that was brilliant. That he reappropriated the forum that had been designed to preserve for posterity his greatest woes, and instead had used that as the mechanism to transmit to his children and grandchildren the very language and culture which had been targeted for destruction. It's remarkable. And yet when I look at the process that was the TRC writ large, I'm forced to conclude, or rather, it is with great pleasure that I conclude that the residential school survivors have appropriated that process in a similarly magnanimous way. That they took this thing that was supposed to be the venue, that was supposed to act as the arbiter of uh, these past traumatic experiences, and instead used that as a way to deliver to this country a plan to make itself better make itself better by addressing this country's original social justice challenge, the challenge of doing right by indigenous people, right? Because the TRC was the place where we were supposed to hear about all the wrongs that had been committed to indigenous people. We did hear those things. At the end, did we get a document blaming people? No. Instead, we had a call to action for each and every one of us to do better and to rise up and fulfill that greater part of our humanity. And to me, that's a remarkable prog progress, process. And uh, it is the reason why I believe that uh, the three commissioners, Marie Sinclair, Wilton Littlechild, and uh, Marie Wilson, should um, be honorary recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of all residential school survivors. <laughs> So we've had an awakening. We've had an awakening delivered to us by this process that was unleashed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think that um, that's been a powerful catalyst to engage uh, non-Indigenous Canada in a conversation about um, what needs to take place. And the calls to action, absolutely 100%, are an excellent roadmap. And the companion document, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, I think is also a powerful roadmap and how to improve uh, relationships with indigenous communities, indigenous people, and indigenous nations. And so it's good to see that there is a dialogue happening between uh, indigenous and non-indigenous. However, um, non-indigenous people in the room should also know that there is another dimension to reconciliation happening. And the conversation is one that's primarily happening within our community. Right? As important as it is to cultivate good relationships with everyone else, there is also a tremendous urgency for us to have reconciliation within our own families, within the generations, in our homes. And um, it is probably uh, one of the most impactful legacies of the residential school era, that there are continuing emotional gulfs between residential school survivors and their descendants. An inability to communicate, an inability to express love, an inability to show affection, an inability to exert discipline in a way that is constructive rather than harmful, an inability to unlearn the learned behaviors that were uh, delivered to so many of us. And I really have to credit uh, the chief here, uh, Bobby Joseph, for helping me to understand this legacy. You know, I um, never fully appreciated it until I heard him speak. I believe it was 2011, 
at the uh, Winnipeg Convention Center, there was a conference called um, Hidden Legacy, Assembly Manitoba Chiefs put it on, about the intergenerational impacts of residential schools. And uh, I was, you know, you know, like the big nerd that I am, I'm sitting front row while Bobby Joe was speaking. All excited. But he said something very profound, or at least it was profound to me. Speaking in a general sense from a residential school survivor to his child, he said, we always loved you. We just never knew how to show you. I had been on earth for 30 years and I never knew that. All my life I thought my dad hated me. And it wasn't until Bobby Joe said those words that I realized that that wasn't true. That my father always loved me. He simply was never equipped with the ability to translate what was in his heart. He simply never had the ability to express that in a constructive way. And so all that spiritual energy that he harbor harbored in his body instead was manifested in the ways that were cultivated in residential schools, through anger, through frustration, through quick temper, and on and on and on and on and on. But that realization, I have to thank you, sir, because that was liberating. Absolutely, 100%. was liberating for me because from that point on, I was able to cultivate a healthy relationship with my father, you know, based on further compassion and understanding for what he had lived through and experienced. And so that was a remarkable thing. And that is the type of experience that is happening in our communities, and yet we need to see more of the ability to, to, to fix the, the chain. Interesting digression. In our language, the word for great-grandparent, Don Kobitagan, is the same as the word for great-grandchild, Don Kobitagan. And within that word is an allusion to like a braid or a chain, an unbroken chain down through the generations. There's tremendous wisdom in our language, as evidenced by that example. And so that is what we are trying to repair, is the braid that chains us back through a proud lineage, through great civilizations, through uh, indigenous nations all across the country. And yet, I've observed in the time since a terrible irony about this journey of reconciliation that we're all on. Bear in mind this truth, as evidenced by the story that I just shared about Bobby Joseph. One of the most powerful catalysts that has allowed me to step outside of the historic legacy and downward trajectory that uh, my family tree has too often been on has been knowledge of that historic context itself. By becoming aware of the intergenerational impacts of residential schools, I was able to start stepping out of it myself to make the conscientious decision that I am not going to treat my kids the same way that I was treated, that I am going to work hard each and every day to be a better dad, to be more supportive, to be a better partner, to be more communicative. And those things don't happen by accident. It takes work. That's the unsexy work of decolonization. It's way cooler to be on a barricade wearing camouflage. But as it turns out, it's much more impactful to stay at home and raise your kids and put food on the table and speak your language to them. And so I have recognized, in the process of learning about the historic context that my family was placed in, some inspiration to step outside of it. So the irony that I spoke of, that I've realized uh, increasingly, or become increasingly uh, aware of, is that those who are most likely to have been impacted by the past colonial projects and ongoing impacts of colonial violence against indigenous people, those people who are most impacted by those things are too often those least likely to know about that history. And what I mean by that is this. 
If your grandparent was a residential school survivor and your parent was part of the 60s scoop and you are today in the care of the child welfare system, you are disproportionately more likely to receive a substandard education, to end up in the criminal justice system, to grow up bouncing from house to house, to never even hear the words reconciliation, never mind residential school or colonization, decolonization, and are consequently being deprived of the opportunity to better yourself through acquiring that piece of knowledge which might harbor within it a greater hope for yourself and for your future. And so knowledge is power. But the lack of knowledge for many of our young brothers and sisters is frustrating, to say the least. Yet I remain hopeful. Reconciliation is real. Reconciliation is powerful. You know, uh, Rye asked us to reflect on what reconciliation is. And I know there are many powerful examples of reconciliation uh, afoot. And I really do like the concise definition that the TRC gave us, that reconciliation is about cultivating respectful relationships. It's easy to remember. Cultivating respectful re relationships. So that's good. But I had this woman in uh, Nautikamiguaning, Ontario, uh, Whitefish Bay, uh, I think share with me a uh, powerful definition of what re reconciliation is as well. And so she said to me, you know, the pipe. And I know there's many teachings about the pipe, so I don't want to uh, step on anyone's toes, but one teaching about the pipe and what it represents that I've heard growing up is this, that the pipe is two separate entities. You have the bowl and you have the stem. One is a woman and one is a man. They each have their own integrity on their own. They each are separate entities. And yet when you put the bowl and stem together, it becomes something new and something greater. And it's more powerful than it was before. So she said, that is what you need to do. That's what you need to be. You need to take the mainstream world, and you need to take our world, and you need to put them together and make something new and more powerful than what was there before. And so to me, that is what reconciliation can be. I'm now a member of the New Democratic Party, so forgive me if I get a little partisan here. If the new liberal federal government does everything it says it's going to do, right? If they do everything they say they're going to do, equally fund education, equally fund child welfare services on reserve, make sure that there's clean drinking water in every community across the country, if they do all that, Congratulations, you've now done the bare minimum of what should have always been the case in this country. Which would still be progress, and I'm not, I wouldn't complain. But it's important to maintain perspective, right? I still hear people, hey, they gave us $8 billion. No. They gave the Department of Indigenous and Northern Affairs $8 billion. That's not self-determination. That's not indigenous nationhood. Indigenous nationhood will be, when, will be fully realized, fully reified in this country, when our communities fully determine the priorities for our own children, grandchildren, and can deploy the resources necessary to achieve those things without concern for contribution agreements, modern treaties and things like that. So why did I digress into that partisanship, that blatant partisan message? Well, because we're not even close to that pipe vision yet, right? We're just getting to like leveling the playing field a little bit. And by the way, it shouldn't be partisan at all, right? doing right by indigenous kids, to me that shouldn't be partisan at all. 
that little kids in this country don't get a fair shot at life because their school is underfunded by $4,000 per student per year or because they don't have clean drinking water or because they're in the care of a CFS agency that is underfunded by some 30%? I don't care where you are on the ideological spectrum. That should be offensive to you. If you're on the progressive end, that should offend you because it offends your principles of social justice. But you're, if you're on the conservative end, that should offend your sense that everybody in our society should get an equal starting point and then be free to achieve whatever they are capable of achieving in their lives. And so we're still confronted with the reality that uh, we need to muster political will to accomplish these things. But the reason why I wanted to bring that up is to highlight that we still have a ways to go before we can even talk about unleashing and beginning to harness the full potential of what reconciliation might afford us. Right? Like it seems to me that if income inequality is one of the great issues of our time, then if people who at a Sundance tell you that the chief should be the poorest person in the community might have something to say about how to uh, create a more compassionate economic order. It seems to me that in a country asking about accommodation and how to respond to the global humanitarian crisis that is a refugee uh, situation, um, it seems to me that a people who have always ha extended their hands to newcomers even though that trust had sometimes been betrayed, might have a thing or two to offer to that conversation. And certainly it seems to me that in a time of climate change, of rising oceans, of global warming, that a people who have always said that the earth is our mother might have something valuable to contribute to that conversation. And so, yeah. And so to me, when I look at the great issues of our time, I know that indigenous nations have something to contribute, have something powerful to offer. And so I ask uh, that we all work hard to try and uh, make that a better uh, tomorrow. So I'm, I notice Rai is fidgeting here at the front, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna conclude with one more anecdote. I don't wanna put the, this, person on blast, but he's a former federal minister of the Crown, and he's also an honorary witness of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we were at a forum for the honorary witnesses, of which I'm very humbled and honored uh, to be a part of in uh, Toronto, discussing what should the honorary witnesses uh, do or be, or, and what is the role? And this, you know, former politician said, well, uh, you know, I kind of think, you know, once the TRC wraps up, then our job wraps up, we're kind of done with it at that. We're ambassadors for the TRC, and when there's no more TRC, that's, uh, that's it. But my um, esteemed colleague, uh, or uh, rather uh, uncle, I should refer to him as uh, Eugene here, Eugene Bird, uh, kindly but gently reminded him, I'm a residential school survivor. I do not have the luxury of hanging up that title. I do not have the luxury of saying the TRC is done, my pain is done. I will carry this burden with me for the rest of my life. And how do you argue with that? And so the message was to each of us as honorary witnesses, carry this message forward for the rest of your lives. Retell these stories. Tell your children. Ensure that the next generation of Canadians knows the truth of what happened in these lands. And I think that that was a powerful directive a powerful imperative for, resident, for the uh, honorary witnesses of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But I'd argue that it's also a powerful imperative for everybody else in the room too. That it is a powerful call to action to appropriate the terminology of the TRC. When I look at Murray Sinclair, when I look at Bobby Joseph, when I look at Eugene Arcan, when I look at Barney Williams, you know, when I look around the room, and I ask myself, have they done their share to advance reconciliation in this country? Yes, it's a resounding yes. When I look at Cindy Blackstock and realize that she got the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal to 
put into writing that the federal government is discriminating against First Nations children in this country. And I ask myself, has she done her share to advance reconciliation in this country? Yes, yes, a resounding yes. But when I look in the mirror, have I done enough to advance reconciliation in this country? And I'm not one to judge, but when I look around the room and my mind begins to wander, have each and every one of us done enough to advance reconciliation? Well, the yes, at least in my own case, when I look in the mirror, is not so resounding. And so there is work left to do. Because I don't know about each and every one of you, but when my two sons ask me, what did I do in this historic moment? when indigenous women were standing up and demanding to be able to live their lives free of violence, when indigenous kids were demanding the ability to grow up free of shame, particularly for our two spirited brothers and sisters who are taking their own lives far too often these days. When my sons and descendants ask me, what did I do? I want to be able to tell them that I did what I could. And now it's up to you to do the same. Hamatakiase, kina naskumit na kakiel, kimi gochu yek pizindao yek indiroi magani tok. Thank you very much for listening to me.